over your uh, shoulder, you have a, a the Migos. What is this? Cheddar. <laughs> is this popcorn? White cheddar with a dab of ranch popcorn. This is yours. You actually have a company where you are selling wrap snacks. Please tell us, sir. What? <laughs> how did you get into this business? So Rap Snacks was founded and, and created in the mind of James Lindsay. James is a HBCU graduate, Cheney University, started, he came up with the idea for Rap Snacks 27 years ago. And um, he launched it in 94. You know, Rap Snacks was launched in 1994. Uh, and um, I've known James since 96. 96, you know, we, we started Rocket. And um, and we started a foundation around the success of Raps Max and the product and what it and what it means to the community. So we started a 501c3 Raps Max Foundation boss up, which I, I'm the president of the Raps Max Foundation. And um, what we do is we, we leverage the success of Raps Max into community economic development programs, entrepreneurship, financial literacy for the young black youth. Uh, you know, so we want to expose them to to various positive attitudes, lifestyles, pathways, and potential careers. You know. Can you do, can you do that wise intelligent while having the face of it be somebody that may not be uh, rapping about these things that are positive, that are inspiring, that are empowering? I feel like there's a contradiction there. Right. That's a that's a good question. You know, um, it's a question that we get often. You know, um, so when when you consider the artists that's on the back, they're a part of what we do as far as community service and community give back. And, and what I mean by that is even those artists are being taught how to uh, how how to expand themselves into other lanes beyond the beyond the corner, beyond illicit activity. You know, a lot of these artists didn't even re don't even realize that the verticals that's that that are associated with rap and hip hop. So that's a part of the, the program as it relates to the artists on the backs. You know, some of these artists have never have, have, have had no clue whatsoever as to the opportunities that exist within hip hop culture that that don't relate to the streets. You know, um, like for, you know, a single bag of single bag of rap snacks, you have multiple career pathways in that one space. So, so you're mentoring, you're mentoring, you're bringing them in. You because you know, I'm yes. looking at we were talking about Young Thug last week in Ghana, and I'm like. <sighs> When do we leave? The I mean, it's like it's almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy prophecy. You're rapping about these things, but then you are bringing that filth into the community through your lyrics. You are fomenting these these divisions and these battles and these these, you know, these kind of like the violence and, and all of that. And then now you are all hemmed up and you, you go into jail, you know, and right. and you're a millionaire like you. You already got free. Like, why are you why are you still rapping about the same things? Exactly. Jay Z, Jay Z with four, four, four. And, all, you know, all those like, he's not rapping about the Marcy projects anymore because he is now a different person. And now he's rapping about wills and art and things and, and his daughter. And that should be the evolution. Right. Exactly. So, you know, and that's that's part of the reason that the foundation exists, you know, to uh, to create to highlight those distinctions, you know, um, and, and help young people find alternatives to what they've been conditioned to believe is viable economic options, you know. Um, and and then you have the incentivization. We're fighting against the incentivization of destructive attitudes, lifestyles. You know, it's being incentivized at the same time. So the, so we, we're fighting we're fighting a serious war here. We're, we're in a war. It's not just a struggle. You know, uh, because the incentivization of those attitudes and lifestyles is really what's keeping a lot of young people in that space. Yeah, it's like the ca carrots being dangled. Here's the Ferrari, here's the diamond baguettes and all of the clothing, all of, all of that, and the women. You can get a lot of women here. Look, 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 look. And here, you can get off the pole and do this and be very, very wealthy and buy these cars and stuff. But nothing nothing gives back to the community. Nothing's about community. And you say that's by design, right? So how do we, what's the solution? I feel like we shouldn't listen to the music, right? That's one way that we can use our dollars and our ear holes and our algorithms to say we reject this. But what else do you, what else can we do? 
wise, intelligent to. Well, yeah, to my, you know, my perspective is that power is exercised at the institutional level. You know, this is why racism is a power construct. You know, racism cannot be effective without control of the institutions on which people depend to sustain their lives. So it will begin for me with uh, control of the institutions in our communities at the local level. You know, the educational institutions, the financial institutions, the judicial institutions, the political institutions, the cultural institutions, these institutions have to be controlled by the people of the communities because when they're not, then the carrot can be dangled. We're not, we don't control the platforms for the dissemination of our cultural aesthetics, for our cultural resources, for our academic resources, and so on and so forth. So, you know, take Rap Snacks, for example. Uh, you go to a corner store. You go to a corner store in any hood USA, and you look at the products on the, on, in, on the shelves in the corner store, the bodega, whatever we call them these days, and, and out of 500 project products, none of them are produced by us, you know. We don't produce any of the products. We don't distribute any of the products. We don't manufacture any of the products. And now we don't even own the retail outlets in those in the neighborhoods, you know, that that's selling the products. For example, Rep Snacks distributor in Mississippi distributes to over a thousand mom and pop stores within that state. And only three of those mom and pop stores are black owned, but they're all in black communities. Why that's is that? That's a problem. Well, is, is that our fault though? My dad had a, a corner store in Newark for 18 years uh, on the corner of Ridgewood and Madison it was the thing that allowed for me to go to school without any student loans. He was in that store 18 hours a day for 18 years. And I remember, you know, him coming home doing the books and it was a store that was left him by his father. So I feel like a lot of the time we, it's, some of that is on us at Wise Intelligent. Like we allow, people can come into our community and put up anything. Yeah, right. I mean, but, you got, but you have to understand the process that, that brought this to, to bear. You know, it was a process. It didn't, we didn't just wake up one day and say, we don't want to own the businesses in our community. You know, integration was one of those double-edged swords, or was it just a single-edged sword that did exactly what it was, what it was designed to do? You know, um, so what integration did was it actually caused Black dollars and Black wealth, Black academia, or black intelligence here it, to flee the community. You know, it, it caused a lot of uh, black resources to leave the black community, you know, and it set the black community up for, uh, for trade imposed to be, trade imposed to be set up to extract the, the resources out of the community at the same time. So, you know, today they classify the communities as under the resource communities. They say the, the black community is an under resource community, but it's not. It's an over extracted community because of these trading posts that were set up during integration. So now all of the, the manpower, wealth, and resources from the black community is being extracted out as opposed to staying in the community and circulating uh, long enough to empower the institutions in the community. We don't even control those institutions anymore. So it's not, uh, it's not that we, it's, it, yes, we, we have to take some responsibility and accountability for, for what occurred, but we had leaders, you know, we had leaders who, who made these decisions for us. You mm. know, who made these who elected them? I was, I was talking yesterday, um, cause they're on all over television right now. And I, ju I do want your thoughts on what, on the, on Corporate the Buffalo America. massacre. Corporate, Corporate America, America made the decisions for, Corporate America made the decisions for, you know? It's, it, you know, it's when you realize that there's a community in, a, in the United States that has $40 billion worth of uh, buying power, $40 billion, and this is 1954. And you're like, okay, how do we get that? How do we get that buying power from those, from that community? You know, how do we sell the Negro? We need the buying buy power. We have to integrate. We have to integrate. That's how, you know. So that, that killed a lot of black businesses killed a lot of black businesses and extracted uh, the lion's share of black wealth and resources out of the community. Wise Intelligent is here. Uh, President and CEO of the Rap Snacks Foundation. Um, Buffalo, the massacre at Buffalo, I'm, I'm spending time for the duration of the year and beyond, which I've always done, talking about solutions. I don't, I can't see forward unless we sit for a minute and plan out what it looks like to build a community, 
that has within it self-defense, that has within it a, a multiple year plan for educating our children, that has economic development and housing and all of the food, because that was another thing, yeah, access to food, um, healthy food, all of these things have to be a, a part of the plan. What are your thoughts about what happened, first of all, and how we can prevent it from happening again? Hmm. This, you know, these occurrences, you know, whether it's Buffalo, Charleston, South Carolina, you know, it's, it's what America is psychologically. You know, um, America has an anti-Black operating system, has an anti-Black psychosocial operating system, you know. Um, so everyone in America that's raised in America went through American institutions in terms of education, graduated from an American high school, graduated that high school with some anti-Black sentiment, even if you're Black, you know? And I think that's probably the biggest tragedy of America in the South, is that our own, the, the consciousness of the Black family themselves has been falsified against themselves. So that makes it easy for us to believe the worst about ourselves because that's the psychology. The American psyche is an anti-Black psyche. It's an anti-Black psychology. So that being the case, you know, Buffalo is going to happen. It's happened before. It's going to happen again. It's going to keep happening, you know, because they keep separating those incidences from the broader context of that American psychology the anti-Black American psychology. You know, you have to put it in that context because we, we look at, you know, these jarringly violent incidences of, of uh, Black massacre, you know, the, the massacre and slaughter of Black lives. We see these things and we're like, wow, this is, this is, this is horrible. But, you know, what we do is we detach it from the financial institutions, the academic institutions the political institutions, the judicial institutions that are massacring and slaughtering black lives in a more subtle way, you know, but with the same result at the end of the day, because the psychology is the same psychology. It's the same anti-black psychology that we're dealing with, but by separating the two and not putting Buffalo, New York in the broader context of the American psyche, mm -hmm. it allows the dominant culture to escape accountability for their mindset and behavior. Wise well, intelligent, before I let you go, I always want to know what was your road to Damascus? You know, like growing up in New Jersey, you know, like every other kid, you're, you're exposed to all of the things that every other kid is exposed to. What allowed you to see the world a little differently, to, to be clear about what your role would be? Well, I, you know, I'm from Trenton, New Jersey. You know, and uh, New Jersey is the state where the Abbott law was passed for the schools. You know, you had Abbott school districts in New Jersey where, you know, for school funding and things of that nature. It was a case in, from a kid whose last name was Abbott out of Camden, New Jersey, who graduated 12th grade and couldn't read. So he was sued. The state was sued and the school system was sued and and they and they won, you know, um, and so they renamed these districts, the Abbott districts, you know, where they would get better funding and things of that nature. Because what was happening was black people in New Jersey and other states were protesting the poultry funding that they were getting in inner city schools for uh, per student. You know, so this was the, the point for me. This is the thing that that kind of shook me, you know. So in some places in, in New Jersey, it was $11,000, $9,500 per student in black communities, some, some less, some 7,500. And then in suburbs like Princeton, New Jersey, 19,500 per student, Cherry Hill, like 24,000 per student. So it was almost three times the amount of some of the school districts that we grew up in. You know, and when black people try to get more funding, the white community will protest all the way to the Supreme Court to stop it because 
they were saying that this is a redistribution of the wealth, it's socialism, you're taking from the rich, you give it to the poor, and you know schools are funded by property tax. So, of course, there would be more funding where the houses are valued higher, right? You know, which is subjective as well, and, and racist. So at the end of the day, what happened was I then realized that they were paying $71,000 in the same state a year to keep the same kid in prison. So you're paying $71,000 a year to put me in prison, taxpayers' money. You're paying $71,000 to keep me in prison, but you won't pay $19,000 for me to get an education equal to that kid over there. So you're willing to pay three times the amount of the highest education here to keep me in prison but you won't pay this one third of that prison cost to give me a full education. That's eye opening for me. That, now, that, that was the point that, that kind of, I jumped out the window at that point. Okay. And, and was there a book that then sent you down a rabbit hole? Cause these, you know, today folks spend hours and hours on YouTube researching stuff like this Cretan that went and killed uh, those beautiful yeah. ten people and and bought you know in in Buffalo was there a book that radicalized you into knowledge? Well, you know, I no 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 books radicalized me. My circumstance radicalized me. You know, if I'm radical, if I'm going to be considered radical, we can use that title and say, okay, he's radicalized. I you know I, I use really... it as ironic. I use it for irony. Right. So, so so it wasn't it was the circumstance i mean we're born into it like you know what made you become an activist you know the circumstance made you become an activist right so we're in constant we're in communities where poverty has been concentrated at astronomical rates right we're in you know legislatively intentionally like trent new jersey again rcas they coincide signed into effect these this rca program where wealthier or more affluent communities could could defer there, they could pay places like Trenton to take on their responsibility, their share of low income housing, right? So they would do that. So then it created a poverty rate in Trenton of like 24%, while the poverty rate in Princeton was like 1.9%, in Washington Township, 1.7%, you know, but Camden and Trenton had 24, 27, 30% poverty rates. The high school in Trenton, New Jersey had a 71% poverty rate amongst the student body, you know? Mm. So that's because of concentrated poverty. So when you, when you start to realize that you're in this dynamic, you know, you have to actively do something. You have to be active in trying to undo this reality. And that's what creates the, uh, that's, that's the radicalization, if you will.